Welcome to this podcast on data and information management. This will involve a discussion about questions related to databases, managing data, and working with information in the computer fields. These topics are from question four of the 2023 Information Technology or IT November Theory exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video by clicking on a link in the video description which will take you to a PDF with those questions. And then attempt those questions next. And then once you are done, you can come back and listen to the podcast and compare your answers with the answers that you got. If you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then listen to the discussion and then download those questions that we mentioned earlier. And then try to test yourself to see how well you know the answers from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about data and information management. Now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about this topic of data and information. Welcome to our podcast series where we're going to look at the data and information management question from the IT 2023 question for paper two or the theory exam. Now we're not going to do this as a discussion. I'm going to just talk through the answers as if I'm discussing it with you. So that's the format for this particular podcast. So let's talk about information and data management where we're going to talk a lot about databases and data. So let's start off with our first question. And question one is we have an extract below of a table called TBL learners. We can see some details about learners. And the first question is, what is the purpose of a primary key in a table? That's a straightforward definition of a primary key. And that is basically a primary key is a field in a table that can uniquely identify each record in a table. It's a way to uniquely identify each record. I have a video that talks about primary keys on my computer terms channel. I suggest that you watch that. That's going to be very valuable to you if you need to learn more about primary keys. It helps you to identify them, the details about them. So go check that video out if you don't know enough about primary keys. But there is a straightforward definition about primary keys. So while we're on the topic of primary keys, there are two rules when it comes to primary keys when you are choosing a field that is suitable for a primary key. And our second question asks what requirement of a primary key except for not having duplicate values. So because a primary key must be unique, you cannot have duplicate values, but that's not what they're asking, they're saying except. So we need another reason or another requirement for the primary key. And the two rules that I always say for primary keys must be unique. And the second rule is it cannot be blank or it cannot be null. It can't be a field that has nothing in it because then you can have two fields with nothing in it. So it must have a value and it must be a unique value. So that's just some general primary key theory. But we're still looking at this table and so we're going to have to interact with it some way. So I'm thinking 4.1.3 A says the structure of the table above will result in anomalies. Anomalies means there's going to be data integrity is going to be lost. Data is not organized well. What design error in this table might lead to an anomaly? Okay, so let's try identify a couple of things here. Now the first thing that sticks out for me is if you look there at the register class and the teacher you can see that every student has a register class and every student has a registered teacher but that teacher's got nothing to do with the students got to do with the register class so there's stuff that's not dependent on the primary key of this table we've got duplicate data you can see the teacher's data is being duplicated and so that's going to create an anomaly for example if i had to delete a particular student and that was the only student of that register class, if this is the only place I'm storing the teacher in that register class, then I've lost the data that contains that teacher was in that register class. And let's say, for example, I put a student in and that for that record, we say that the teacher has changed register so there's a new teacher in 10a maybe it's long mr long's now the teacher of 10a but that's a problem because now we've got some records which say 10a is long and some records which say 10a is void so we've got an anomaly there and the other information that's lacking let's say we want to add a teacher the details of a teacher we can't do that until we have a student that's in that register class which makes an insert anomaly so there are a couple of design issues here first of all data is duplicated in the teacher field if the teacher is replaced the data needs to be corrected everywhere that would be our update anomaly I've spoken about the insert and the delete anomalies. All those are valid. But basically, this table is not normalized. The table contains redundant data. There, that teacher field. And it's linked to the register class. It's actually got nothing to do with the student. Teacher has got nothing to do with student. It's got to do with the register class. 
if I take the students away, that teacher is still allocated to a register class. So that's why it's dependent on that field. So you're basically, when it comes to normalization, every field must be dependent on the primary key and teacher is not. So that is the problem with the structure of this table. Now B, it says suggest how this design error can be resolved and explain how a solution can be compromised. Now I've already checked the memo and they have said that you can use a diagram to explain this process. So I'm going to do both. I'm going to explain to you what we're going to do and then we'll show you in a diagram format. So let's start off with the basic answer is we need two tables. We need a table that identifies just the details of the learners and then we need a table that has details about the register classes so that's what i would I'd split it into two tables and all the details about the students will go into the student tables in the learners table so id first name surname age gender would go into the tbl learners in the register class i would put in the register class table i'll put register class and teacher so just those two fields and definitely have you've got to indicate your primary key so i would say that the primary key of the register class is obviously the register class and the primary key of the learners is the ID. Now we need a way to connect them. So the primary key of one of them has to be in the other table. So I think the best way to maybe talk about this is to look at a diagram where you can see where it would fit. So as we said, create a separate table, move the register class and teacher fields to that table. And we'll use the register class field as the foreign key in the learners table and the primary key in the new table. So let me explain that with a diagram. So let's take this table. We're going to create a new table for the learners. So there we're going to have ID. We're going to have first name, surname, age, and gender. So let's forget about register class for now. Just pretend we just have just have those four in for now. ID is the primary key. And then we have first name, surname, age, and gender. Then we're going to then have details about the register class, which we'll have the register class detail and the teacher detail. Register class will be the primary key. Now we need to connect them. Now there are two ways of connecting this table. Either we put the ID primary key into the register class table as a foreign key, or we put the register class ID or primary key as a foreign key in the learners table. Let's take the first scenario. If I put the ID of the learners in the register class table, that means every register class will have a like 10A would have teacher Boyd and it would have one learner's ID, which means only one learner can be in a register class. And that doesn't make sense. A register class has lots of learners, so that doesn't work. Now, if we change it up, if we say like we've got the register class is a foreign key, that's what F key stands, stands for, is the primary key of the other table is now in this table. So what this means is for a learner, they will be allocated to a register class and a learner can only be allocated to one. So that makes sense. And that register class field in TBL learners could be 10A, 10A, 12C, and so on. it could be duplicated because it's a foreign key. It's not a primary key in the learners table. It's a foreign key. So by doing that, and we're going to indicate that relationship that the register class from the primary key of the register class table is a foreign key in the learners table. So that's what I would do to split these tables up. As I said, the memo did say you can do a diagram to explain it, or you could just explain it. I think a diagram works better. I would have done that. Okay. So let's go into our next question, which is 4.2. Let's talk about validation versus verification. What is the difference? Compare the concepts and indicate why validation does not remove the verification. We still need both. So validation is basically ensuring that the data is the correct, acceptable or valid option. It fits what we are looking for. It doesn't tell us if it's actually accurate. Verification is to ensure that the correctness of the data. Validation ensures that the data is of the right type of data. That's what I basically mean. So for example, validation checks to see if data is the right format. It checks that the data has been entered, is that it's the right data type, that the check digits valid, that it's the right length. It tells all those things. So for example, your birth date. We want to validate that your birth date, it is an actual date that you were born in the year 2000 on 11th, 21. So that is a valid birth date, but we don't know if that's an accurate birth date. In other words, is that really your birth date? So that's why we need verification. And we can do that in multiple ways. We can ask people to repeatedly add data. We can compare that data to other data from other systems, or we can get people to verify the information. So if the data is valid, it only implies that the information is in the correct format or data type or range, but verification is required to make sure that it's actually the correct information that it is accurate. In a test, for example, you might be given a mark of 84 out of 100. Now that is a valid mark, but we don't know if it's the accurate mark. What happens if we mistyped it and we actually were supposed to say 48? We would need someone to verify that information is accurate. 
So that's why we do need both. Make sure the correct type, but also check that it's accurate. Let's move on to 4.3.1, a programming language that is mostly used to extract data from a database. Now there's a universal database language that hopefully you've learned as IT students, and that is SQL, I mean SQL, and that's Structured Query Language Code. It's a very useful language for in all systems, they all use some sort of SQL. So it's very wise to make sure that you learn SQL and get clued up on it. So it can be very useful if you're gonna go into any industry which works with databases. So while we're on that topic, can we identify a scenario when a server-based database would be required and explain how a server-based database would serve to cater for the needs and of the scenario identified? So you get desktop-based databases and you get server-based ones. The server ones is normally when you've got lots of people that need to use it. So we're looking at a lot of people trying to access that database particularly from different locations. They could do it at different times. So database will allow many users to use the database at once, multiple users, and normally in different locations. That improves the accessibility. So if you're accessing Google servers, there are Google servers all over the world. That's a server type of database that you'll be accessing because lots of people are accessing it at once and we access it from different locations. So let's move on to 4.4.1. And we've got a question about how does the creation of an audit trial enhance the data security in a school database? Now, audit trial is just a way to double check your data. It basically finds out and tracks what changes are made, tracks when the changes were made, and tracks who made those changes. So in a database system, we have an audit trail which tells us that a mark was changed from 84 to 83 on this date by Mr. Long. That's a track of who made those changes. So we can see who made the changes and what changes were made. If something goes wrong, we can always roll back those changes. Or if we want to query why that change was made, we can always go find out who did it and when it was done. So that's what you do for audit trials or trails, however we pronounce it. And then 4.4.2. I suggest an alternative method to enhance security besides audit trails of the school's database and explain how it can be used. Okay, there are lots of options. This is just a two mark question. There are lots of possibilities. We want to enhance security of our school's database. Anything that's reasonable. So let's take, for example, access control, making sure you've got passwords or biometric devices or ways of locking the server room to prevent physical access as well from that database that can help you enhance your security. We can encrypt the data. So if someone steals it, they can't get it unless they've got the key. So prevent unauthorized access. Also to prevent, for example, ransomware attacks or you lose your data, you want to make sure you make regular backups. Essential for protecting your data. If there's a failure or if there's a disaster happens, maybe there's a fire, your data gets corrupted or we have experienced a ransomware attack. It can be quite daunting. You want to make sure that you've got a backup. Other things that could be, you could have had a firewall to prevent someone from illegally accessing or that you don't want to access your server. So those are other options as well. So lots of potential options. Any one of those would do. Yeah, and I think that's the end of the question. That is question four of our IT paper. Hopefully you found this talk useful. Hopefully it's helped you with your understanding of data and information management. And let's move on to question five for those who are keen to try it. Thanks for listening to this podcast. We have some wonderful videos on our data and information management playlist. Make sure that you subscribe to Atmos Long Computer Team so you don't miss them. Also check out our other channel, Atmos Long IT and Cat, for information about the other stuff. And remember, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long way.